Okay, so our source images are shot. The next step is to import them into Darktable, do some basic processing to prepare them for stitching, then export them and then stitch them. That's what we're going to do in this episode. Let's go. Hi, and welcome to episode 74 of Understanding Darktable. So this should almost be Understanding Darktable and Hugen, because in this episode we are going to be using both Darktable and Hugen. So I've imported my images from last week uh, into Darktable. As we can see, they're all here in the Lightroom. And just to reiterate what I was saying in the last episode about always shoot left to right, it's so now I can zoom those down to there and I can get an idea straight away of what that panorama would look like once it was stitched. I can see the field of view. If I shot from right to left, then all of those thumbnails would be in the reverse order. Okay, the first thing that I will do, if you've been watching my channel for a while, you know I am manic when it comes to tagging. So if we look at these images, I've got no tags on them at the moment. When I shoot a multi-image pano, I tag these files with panoramic source. That way, if I at any stage want to find the source images for a multi-image pano, I can search on that tag and find them. And I find it more sensible to use a separate tag like panoramic source than simply panorama, because this way I can differentiate between the source images for a panorama versus the actual finished panoramas, which I would tag with panorama. So I am going to attach that tag. I am also going to attach Sydney Harbour and actually I'll just go Sydney Harbour Bridge and I'll tag Opera House and I could also tag Circular Key because all of those things appear in these shots. But basically, I'm going to put some at least some basic location metadata into all of my images. All right. So in terms of, I, I know I said a few minutes ago, we're going to process these images, but really I'm not in the general sense of the way we think of processing images in Darktable. I'm not going to go right through everything I would normally do on a single image. What I want to do right now is prepare these images for stitching. And in terms of preparing, I want to A, make sure that the white balance is consistent across every frame in a sequence. I want to check each frame for dust or dirt on the sensor, which I'm hoping there won't be any because I made a big thing about cleaning your sensor before you shoot. And I did make an effort to clean my sensor before I went out and shot last week. So I'm hoping that there's no dirt on my images. And then it's a question of, and, and this might sound a bit silly, but what resolution I want to export my source images at. Believe it or not, there are times when this is probably more so going back in time. It, it doesn't happen so much now. But when I was never 100% confident that my images were going to stitch perfectly, what I would do is export my source images at a lower resolution so that the stitching process could be done faster. Because I figured if it was going to fail, I'd rather you know, not sit around waiting half an hour for it to stitch these full res images if I could just export them at maybe, you know, 1500 pixels on the long edge um, and have a multi-image panorama stitched within a couple of minutes. Of course, how long it's going to take is all going to depend on the computer that you're running, how much horsepower you've got, whether it's GPU accelerated. I'm not sure about Hugen. I don't know whether it uses 
GPU acceleration. I, I very much doubt it. It's probably just CPU driven. Uh, is there anything else? I think that's pretty much it. White balance, noise and resolution. They are the main things that I want to look at. So I will start with just this first sequence, which comprises however many images that is. Uh, what have I got there? I've got 10... 17 images uh, making up this first panorama. Now, I'm confident that the white balance is going to be consistent because I was using a daylight preset in my camera. So if I just go to the first image and I check the white balance and then I can just work my way through these images and yep, yeah, that white balance is going to be consistent across all of these. So I don't need to worry about that. I will just pick one of these images here where things get nice and bright and I'm going to zoom in and I'm just going to do a very quick scan through the image and see if there's any dust or dirt on the sensor. It's looking pretty clean. I think I, I, think I got them all clean. So if one image is clean, pretty fair to say that the entire sequence is going to be clean because I didn't take the lens off the camera during the shooting of the 17 source images. And finally, resolution. Now, because there are 17 images here, I don't think I want... Oh, that's the other thing. That's the other thing. I knew there was something else kicking around in the back of my mind. There was something else. The pixel workflow default. Uh, as we are in Darktable 3.2.1, you have the choice of scene referred, display referred, or none. By default, I do have Darktable set up for a scene referred workflow. That means that all of these images will have had filmic RGB and exposure both enabled. I want to turn those off because I really just want to work with the basic raw files first and worry about what processing I'm going to do when I've got the stitched version of the panorama. So I go to my first image and I disable those two modules. That then becomes the last two steps in the history stack. I then jump back to the light table. I go to my history stack, select copy, select none, simply activate those two that say off, exposure off and filmic RGB off, click OK, then select the next image, shift select the last image. So I've now selected the, the other 16 images in this sequence, select paste, those two entries in the history uh, stack are automatically selected because I'd already copied them to the clipboard. Click on OK and now exposure and filmic RGB have been turned off for all of those other 16 images. So now I can select all 17 of those and I'm ready to export. Now I have a preset that I have saved which is Hugh and Low Res. This automatically goes to a folder where I normally export my source images to. And I've got that set to overwrite, that's fine. They're going out as 16-bit TIFF files. So I've basically got the full you know, exposure range of data you know, in the TIFF files as I had in my original RAW files, which from my A73 R14 uh, bit. And I have this set to 1200 pixels. There we go. So I have obviously in the last week, I've been doing a lot of mucking around, obviously in preparation for this little three part mini series. So I have been exporting them at a lower res. And I actually, I might just do that. I'll leave it at 1200 pixels on the long edge, just so that it does speed up the process. Because really at the end of the day, it's up to you, you know, what size you want to export at, but it's not going to change the actual workflow. Profile I've got set as Adobe RGB. Even though I shot these in sRGB, the fact that they're raw, I think that means that, you know, there's potentially more color information than the sRGB color space 
encapsulates. So I'm going to export them as Adobe RGB. That'll just give me a wider gamut to play with. And obviously this is going to be a fairly high contrast image. And that's pretty much it. I'm ready to export. So I will export these 17 images. And once they have exported, I can then go over to Hugen and we can start stitching our panorama. Okay, so our source images have been exported. I have a folder called Hugen Panos and within that I have a folder for layouts and a folder for images. The images folder is where I export the prepared TIFF files to. Uh, and if I sort those by date modified, then I'll have the images that I've just exported at the top. The layouts is where I store the PTO files, which is the panorama project files that Hugen creates. Uh, you will find that when you go to stitch a panorama, Hugen will not proceed unless you have saved the project you cannot stitch a multi-image pano on an unsaved project in Hugen. Just a word of warning there. So this is Hugen. Uh, it is available on Windows, Mac and Linux. I'm running on Linux Mint. And there is quite a lot to understand about Hugen. And this is not going to be an exhaustive lecture on all of the features because I have only used it for the type of panoramas that we're working with right now. Uh, so there's a whole bunch to this app that I've not sort of delved into. In order to get started, we want to add some images, which we can do from the edit menu and add image, or we can click on this little icon right here. I go to my images folder. If I sort by date modified, which you can see I have already done, then these 17 images that I've just exported are right here at the top. I can just shift select all of those, click on open, and Hugen will add all of them to this stack. You'll notice here there is a column called anchor, and you can anchor the image for position and or exposure. Now, I don't really need to change that, but just to explain what that does is out of all of your source images, Hugen is saying which one should be the anchor as far as position goes. And as the name would suggest, if you pick the image right in the middle and you say anchor this for position, then it will say, okay, this image doesn't move from its default landing spot and all other images out to the left and right will be placed accordingly. So I generally do that even if I am confident that I don't need to do it. I just sort of do it by default. And as for exposure, I'm not going to have Hugen making any exposure adjustments because I will do all of that for myself when I bring the stitched panorama back into Darktable. So, we can see all of the files via their name, we can see their width and their height, we can see where they fall in the stack, and there's not really anything else that we need to do in here. Okay, so that's all good. We can see it's a normal rectilinear lens, shot at 50mm. The next thing we need to do is create control points. Now, as I mentioned in the last episode, Control points are things that Hugen adds to each image pair. And each image pair will mean image 0 and image 1, and then image 1 and image 2, and then image 2 and image 3, etc., etc. And what it's looking for is commonalities between what's on the right side of the first image and what's on the left side of the second image. And when it finds what it identifies as common, you know, bits of data, in other words, objects in the frame, then it adds a control point. The more control points we get 
per image pair, the better. In my time of mucking around with Hugen, which is probably about four years now, I guess, I've generally found that if you don't have at least 30 to 40 control points per image pair, sometimes things can get a bit wobbly. But let's just... Well, before I do hit that, let's just have a look at the settings here. There is a whole bunch of different options here. You will find that uh, there are a couple of options for Hugen's Control Point Finder. Uh, the second one includes something called Celeste, which is slower, but it doesn't put control points on clouds. Now, that's probably a good thing to do. If you've got a lot of cloud in your source images, and particularly if you've shot with a slower shutter speed, or if you took a long time to shoot the sequence, the clouds are going to have moved between each frame. So if you find that things aren't stitching properly with the basic Hugen CP find algorithm, maybe try it with Celeste as well, and that will ignore any clouds that it finds in your source images, which hopefully will you know, alleviate some of those issues. So I'm just going to leave it on Hugen CP Find. Again, this is one of those parts of the app that I've not investigated any of these other options, so I can't tell you about them. So we'll go with that, and we click on Create Control Points. And what happens is Hugen basically looks at all of the images. You can see that it's come up with almost 700 control points for my images. And at the moment, it's saying zero in that column. When I click on OK, there we go. And yep, looks like 40 and 43 are the lowest control point counts that I've got. So I'm pretty confident this is going to stitch together well. The next thing we need to do is look at the geometric uh, options here. 99% of the time, I've never had to change any of these drop down uh, menu options. I'm just going to leave it on positions incremental starting from anchor. Click on calculate. Again, it runs the optimizer. Once it has using all of those control points calculated the positions for all the successive frames, it will say that this is what it's done and do you want to apply the changes? We just click yes. And in terms of photometric, low dynamic range for me because this is not an HDR panorama. I'm not trying to do anything funky with the exposure because, as I said, I'll do all that with the stitched image when we get it into Darktable in the next episode. But we do need to calculate that because this also pertains to the way Hugen blends between each image pair. Obviously, as the light changes, I mean, you saw just looking at the source images, quite dark at the left-hand end gets to be quite bright at the right-hand end because I was almost facing the sun. So obviously, Hugen needs to blend all of these source images together, and this is part of that. So we click on Yes. And now, this button up here with the GL on it is our Fast Preview Panorama. And we click on that, and I will just stretch this window out a little bit. And we can see that the image has stitched together, but our panorama is kind of in a smiley face. Now, that has something to do with the angle of the camera relative to the horizon, right? So I was shooting at a bit of an upward angle because I needed to make sure I got the top of the bridge and the pylons in the frame. Now, you'll notice across the top here, we've got assistant preview layout projection, move and drag and crop. What we want to do is go to the move and drag option. And this will allow us to simply click and push, and I can align what I think is my horizon with any one of those straight lines. And I think where I've pushed it to is 
pretty close to where the horizon is. It's a bit hard to see with this grid turned on. And there is an option to turn that off. And that is under the view menu, view grid. So we turn that off. If I want to zoom this in, this is one thing that I haven't quite wrapped my head around with Hugan is it's not exactly intuitive just wanting to zoom in. Like you can't just control click and zoom in like you could in a normal image editing application. So there's my panorama. I think that horizon is looking reasonably straight. I could maybe, yeah, I might just bring it down just a touch to about there. But that is looking pretty good. So I don't need to do anything more in move and drag. I don't need to worry about the projection. I'm happy with what Hugan has come up with by itself. What I can see straight away is, and this was part of the reason for why I wanted to shoot with a longer shutter speed to smooth out the water, you can see these different effects of the ripples of the water in the harbour between each source frame. Now, for something like that, I might be able to get away with some retouching in Darktable or after I have stitched this into a final image I might take it into say GIMP and do a bit of cloning and you know healing in order to smooth out those obvious stitch points that's entirely up to you how you know how much time you want to spend on this stuff but it's just something I've noticed just from viewing this preview Okay, don't need to worry about the layout. That's basically just showing me where all of the source images sit in this sequence. Uh, the preview is, as you would expect, the preview. And the crop allows us to manually crop just by dragging the edges. You'll notice that these are very similar to the, the crop tool in Darktable. You, just, you can control each one uh, individually like so. There is also an auto crop option here. So if you want to crop out all of the excess right here right now you can do that with the auto crop tool and that will keep as many pixels as it can within the cropped area. I actually prefer not to auto crop in Hugan because sometimes I want to like I said either take it into GIMP and do a bit of work in GIMP or I might use the liquify tool if you've watched the episode on the liquify module you'll you would have seen where I use the liquify tool to fill some more sky in at the top of a wide angle panorama that I'd shot of St Paul's Cathedral in London where I just didn't quite have enough sky that would allow me to crop the image the way I wanted it to because I didn't want to lose the top of the spire so I used the liquify tool to just fill in the sky so for that reason I tend not to do the cropping in Hugen although in this instance, I probably could because I can see that I've got everything I want. So, yeah, why not? I'll just do the crop now. So, that's the way our image is going to look. So now, we close the fast panorama preview. We come back to the Hugen panorama stitcher. And now, we need to save our project because if we try and stitch now, it's going to prompt us to save the project anyway so we might as well just do that so I go to my layouts and I am not going to use that predefined uh, template that I've got there so I'm just going to go 2020 it's November it's Sydney Harbour version 1 and save now 
We will just have a quick look at these other tabs before we stitch because there are a couple of tabs here that we can see some different stuff. So the masks tab, if you were to find something in one particular source frame, let's say there was a bird that flew across one of these source images and we thought, oh, I really don't want that bird in the shot. You can actually come into the source image where the bird appeared and you can create a new mask and you can draw a shape around that object. I'm, I don't think there's anything in here that I can actually demonstrate with. It looked like the sky was free of birds completely. Uh, I'm not going to try and take out the ferry that was in the shot. Yeah. Okay. Maybe when I get to the second and third panoramas, there might be something there. But the idea is that you can add a new mask, draw a shape around something. And basically that says to Hugen, when you're stitching, do not use the area inside this mask from this particular source image. So you can basically say these pixels are off limits. These are not to be included in the final panorama, which is a pretty cool feature, I've got to say. Then we've got the control points tab, and here we can actually view all of our image pairs. Now, when you first come to the control points uh, tab, it will be showing you the same image twice. You can see it's image zero on both sides. So we just go to the next option, which is image one. And now we can see all of the control point pairs that Hugen created when we ran that uh, CP find algorithm right at the beginning. And so it added these control point pairs across these two images saying, these are things I've identified as being consistent in both images. And then we can use these left and right arrows to just jump through image pairs. So now we're looking at image one and image two. Now we're looking at image two and image three. And so you can see how many control points there are. And on these, there's only 19, which is actually a little bit low, but it's still managed to stitch this panorama nicely, as we've seen from the preview. But yeah, so you can just jump through, you can see all of the control points, and you can manually add control points if you need to. I'm not going to do that right now because this is already stitched and it's done its job and I don't need to waste time on it. All right, so then we move on to the stitcher tab, and this is where the magic happens. Again, I don't need to change the projection. I'll leave it on equi-rectangular because I've seen the preview and it looked fine. What I can do is calculate the field of view and the optimal size. It's going to make a panorama that is 8,650 pixels wide and 2,272 pixels high. This is why I did not export the full 24 megapixel uh, TIFF files because it would have made this absolutely massive and that would have taken a lot longer to generate the panorama. I can then see the crop values that I put in over here on this crop tab. You'll see that those values there, 1214, 121, 8520 and 1687, they are these values right here. Again, you have the option to fit the crop to the image, so that's like the auto crop option again. I'm just going to leave it as it is, although I can see the cropped version will be 7306 by 1566, equaling 11.4 megapixels and a 14 to 3 aspect ratio. Great information. Thank you, Hugen. Panorama outputs. I just want exposure corrected, and that refers to the blending between the source frames, not about adjusting the exposure of the overall thing, just the blending of exposures in between source images, and it's low dynamic range. 
I don't need to do anything else here I, other than tell it what format I want the exported panorama to be. I want it to be TIFF with no compression. I don't need to worry about the remapped images. That simply refers to the temporary files that Hugen is going to create in the process of stitching our panorama together. You can have it keep the remapped images if you want. I don't need to. I'm not working with stacks. I'm not working with layers. I can leave all of these options as they are. And now I can click on stitch. And again, it's complaining that I haven't saved the project. So I am just gonna cancel that, click on save again, click on stitch. Now it's saying specify an output prefix. That's basically asking you, what do you wanna call the exported panorama? It naturally inherits the name of the project and I'm gonna leave it at that. And I don't need to put a file extension on because we've already told Hugen over here that we want a TIFF file. So it's now just a case of click save. And you will then get to watch as Hugen crunches away, running all of the magic in the background to stitch all of these 17 frames together. I'm not gonna sit here and talk while it does it. I'll talk to you in a minute. Okay, so Hugen has finished. We can close the batch processor, we can close Hugen, and if I sort by date modified again, we can see that the resulting TIFF of our panorama has been created alongside the PTO file in my layouts folder. I generally just let it put them there and I move them later on. But let's just quickly have a look at that. There it is. And you know, we can zoom in, we can see we've got oodles of resolution here. And we've got this nice view of Sydney Harbour with the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Circular key over there, the city, the opera house. Fantastic. So that's just one of the three sequences that I shot. So I am going to stitch the other two. And then in the next episode, we can have a look at all three panoramas and see how they turned out and look at what we can do with post-processing them in Darktable. All right, guys. That's going to do it for this one. Uh, hope you're enjoying this little mini series of how to produce a multi-image panorama. I know it's not for everybody. I, I appreciate that. But quite a few of you asked, so I'm hoping there's a few of you that are getting some value from this. All right. I will talk to you in the next one.